Good morning, everyone. Pastor Brett here. And I just want to wish everybody a blessed Lord's Day and uh, hope and pray that you have a place um, to go uh, where you can fellowship with like minded believers, uh, worshiping our one true and living God in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. Um, and uh, um, I'm thankful for the privilege of being able to be here just in case this is your only place. Hallelujah. So if it is, uh, then let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer and uh, um, we'll thank him and praise him for the privilege of being able to do this. So um, I just want to pray and say, Father, thank you for this day. I thank you for all the people, Father God, the wonderful souls, Lord God, that you've entrusted, Lord God, to me and uh, Lord God, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. But I praise you and thank you for the privilege of being able to share your word with, um, again, Lord God, uh, these people. And uh, I just pray, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that you would speak, that your will would be done. Lord God, that um, these fine souls, Lord God, would um, hear the truth, be strengthened and encouraged, and, uh, Lord God, grow in the faith so that they may trust you, Lord God, in times of testing, Lord God, um, in times of true tribulation. Um, Lord, have your way. Uh, we've been protected um, in the Western world for so long. And, uh, um, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would help us, help these people, Lord God, that uh, when liberties are taken from them, um, that they would uh, praise you, thank you, and uh, find a way, Lord God, to give you all the glory and honor for everything. Thank you for the promise of eternal life. Thank you for all that we have and all that we will have, Father God, with you Hallelujah. in your kingdom. We thank you, we praise you for that promise, and we trust you for it. Hallelujah. Surrendering to you now, in Jesus' name. Well, amen, and I hope you did say amen. Um, and uh, always remember that when you say amen, you're saying I agree. So uh, so I'm thankful for the privilege of being able to share his word with you. And uh, I'm, I want to go to First uh, Peter um, chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 3 through 5. And uh, we're going to see what the Lord has to say here. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So uh, um, I hear that question often. Um, can I lose my salvation? Um, and so uh, I'm going to uh, um, say emphatically, no, you cannot. Well, how do you know this, Pastor Brett? Uh, can you show me this in Scripture? Absolutely. Absolutely. Hallelujah. We're going to look here at this context of uh, 1 Peter 1, and we're going to read verses 3 through 5, and, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Amen? Hallelujah. So uh, the Word of God reads, um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So, a um, couple of points here. All right, he says, uh, Blessed be who? The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so we're talking about our, our Heavenly Father, God, um, who, all right, who, according to His abundant mercy. We, you got to listen to the personal pronouns here. And you have to pay attention to the fact that we're talking about God the Father. Um, we're talking about his plan, his purpose, his will, uh, everything that um, he has in store for you, the believer, um, and uh, 
it's all because of his abundant mercy his abundant mercy um, nothing that we can do uh, I'm reminded of Ephesians 2 um, 8 and 9 uh, where the Apostle Paul uh, says that it's by grace through faith we've been saved by grace through faith and it's the gift of God not of works so that no one can boast but then in verse 10 he says for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works right we're created so that we would do we're saved and and, and we're we're um, given the ability to do the things that God would call us to do by his spirit within us it's he who motivates us it says for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should or would walk in them so it's the Lord that moves us. It's the Lord that guides us. It's the Lord that motivates us. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. You know, he'll put his promise that he promised that he would put his spirit within us and that he would move us to keep his commandments, to do them. Who's at work here? Are you working for the Lord or is the Lord working through you? Hallelujah. Peter says here, um, back to First Peter, he says uh, in, uh, in chapter 1 and verse 3, he says that his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope, a living hope. It's an ongoing promise, all right? It's a promise that will not be taken from us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But then he he. he he shows you this promise here in verse 4. He says, it's to an inheritance that's incorruptible. And it's undefiled. And it fades not away. Uh, which one of those, you know, at what point do you say, okay, well, now he emphasized the fact three times that we're not going to lose this. We can't lose this. It's reserved in heaven for you. Four times in this one verse, Peter shows us emphatically that we cannot lose the gift of eternal life. It's a gift from God. It's not of works so that no one can boast. So we know that this is a promise that just can't be taken away. God doesn't take back what he gives. Paul said in Romans, he says that uh, the Lord doesn't take back what he gives. He doesn't take back what he gives. He, he's, he doesn't give you a gift and then say, oh, you messed up. Give me that back. None of us would be saved. None of us. No, not even Enoch. Not even Enoch. Not even Enoch who, who, whose life was so much um, of a good godly life that he pleased God nah, I find that absolutely impossible in the flesh to please God it's impossible to please God without faith remember Hebrews 11 without faith it's impossible to please God so he that comes to God must first believe that he is and so the Lord puts that faith within us as we've seen before um, and he gives us the faith that we need to live the life that he's called us to live and to be the example that he has called us to be. And it's by his grace, his divine influence upon the heart, he moves us and motivates us to do these things on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's read on verse 5. Again, he says, not only do you have a reservation now, but you say, verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So we're, we're kept that keeping power, that uh, how, how do we maintain this? You know, well, uh, uh, someone once said to me, um, he said to me, he says, oh, I, I believe that, uh, I believe in eternal life as long as we do. Well, there's a condition, okay? 
um, in the Pentecostal tradition. Um, uh, you are saved as long as you're doing the right thing. You know, you're being obedient to the Word of God because, uh, after all, you know, uh, you got to do, 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 do in order to stay saved. And you, God gives it to you freely, but you got to maintain it. Um, you can't work for your salvation. If you have to work to maintain your salvation, you're working for your salvation. Your salvation then becomes um, not a gift, but it's by works so that you can boast. You can say at the end, well, Lord, I did this, and Lord, I did that, and Lord, look at all these wonderful things that we did, and nope, can't do it. It's only by the gift of Jesus Christ. It's only by faith in that finished work on the cross that we can even enter in. And then it's because of his grace, the Holy Spirit's moving and motivating power that enables us to live the life that we're called to live, that we can even live this life. And <clears throat> um, there's, there's, there's not a place in time, in history, in scripture, most importantly, that you can show me where God said, oops, oops, I made a mistake. I made a boo-boo. Um, uh, yes, uh, did God, was was God, um, did it repent God that he made man on the earth? Sure it did, sure it did. He said, you know, that doesn't mean he had uh, a, a revelation or a change of mind. That's only, the, the scriptures were written for us, for our understanding. How does an infinite God explain his infinite nature to a finite creature. He has to speak to us in finite language. Think about that. And uh, we'll read on. Hallelujah. He says, you're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. So, um, who is he that uh, overcomes the world, but he that believeth, right? Um, and this is the victory, I think it's 1 John 4, 4. Let me go there really quick. 1 John 4 and verse 4. Ye are of God little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's not it. But he says, uh, uh, and this is the victory that overcometh the world. What? Even our faith. Um, so we know that it is by faith that we overcome. It is only by faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. There's nothing we can do to um, maintain the salvation. Uh, again, remember what the words of Jesus. And I'm going to John 4.24. John 4, 24 reads this way. Uh, John 5, 24, excuse me. My signal's crossed here. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. John 4, 24, or 5, 24. Jesus said these words. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Gotcha. He said, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me. Believe in the Greek is pistuo, and it means to commit your spiritual well-being to him. It's simply a, a surrender to God. You surrender. You say, that's it. I quit. I can't do it anymore. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, doing this right. I'm not getting it right. I can't get it right. Um, what is it? How do I do this? Yeah. Surrender. Just surrender. And when you surrender, you, you know, I, I, just, I fell on my knees and lifted my hands and said, I surrender. I quit. Lord, I know that you're God, and 
I'm messed up and I just ask you to please have your way with me and reveal yourself to me and show me more about you and help me to be all that you want. All, you know, you just surrender. That's the picture that Pistule gives. It's a complete surrender to God. Um, and, and there's nowhere in scripture that gives us um, the inkling of uh, absolute sinless perfection in the flesh. If the Apostle Paul struggled with desires in the flesh, you will too, all right? If Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, he clearly pointed to when the disciples were with him on the mount and they were just tired and just couldn't hang out anymore. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. All right. We know that there is a fleshly nature and there's a spiritual nature. It's the spirit that's perfect. The spirit that is perfected um, in the sense of uh, you are ready to enter the kingdom of God. And it's a work of God. It's nothing you did. He put that spirit within you. He put the, the belief, the faith in you to believe in him and to surrender him. He moved you. He brought you to that place. And then he gives us a brand new heaven sent spirit. That's the born again experience. Ganawa Nota means to be born from on high. So it's all of God. It's none of us. There isn't anything that we have to do. He says, I say unto you, John again, 524, he says, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not, shall not, well, first of all, if it says you have everlasting life, you got to say, well, where does everlasting begin? The, the moment you got saved, the moment you surrendered to Christ, your promise of eternal life began. It's eternal. It, it doesn't have an ending. From that point on, you are an eternal child of the living God. He says you shall not come into condemnation. So he tells you again, don't worry about it. It's eternal. But it is past. He tells you again. He reiterates this again. Again here. Then three times in this verse, he says. So you got four times in First Peter. Uh, you got three times here. You, you have, uh, you know, an eternal assurance from God. It's kind of like, you know, I, I punched your ticket. You paid in full. Don't worry about it. Remember what the Apostle Paul said to the Colossian church. You are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So we know that we have the promise of eternal life. And we know that we can trust the Lord. Hallelujah. We can't trust ourselves. There isn't anything in us that is inherently good. Um, there is none good, no, not one. All have turned aside to their own way, Isaiah said. All right, but the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hallelujah. So it's all about Jesus and not about us. We didn't do anything to obtain it, and we can't do anything to maintain it. It is a work of the Lord from front to back. Hallelujah. The promise of eternal life is yours to keep. Hallelujah. And so we thank the Lord and praise him for that. Um, you know, and somebody will say, uh, well, you know what? Um, uh, uh, I, 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 I can't do this. So does that mean that I can just go ahead and do whatever I want to do? And I'm saved now, so I can just go ahead and live a life of sin. No. And if you, if you think that, then I would question the sincerity of your commitment. See, God knows your heart, but I can tell whether or not a person is truly saved as a pastor. I have to have this discernment within me. I have to be able to, to tell whether or not a person is doing the things that they need to do so that I can do the things that I'm called to do to help, you know, to encourage. Um, how, do, how, how do I know? What are, what are some evidences of a person's true saving faith? Well, I'm going to see number one, first and foremost for me, I'm going to see a hunger for the Word of God. 
If a person is hungry for the word of God, for the things of God, and wants to be involved with the things of God more and more, uh, then I know that that person knows the Lord. Um, secondly, if, if I'm going to see, uh, 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 want to know if a person truly knows the Lord, um, I'm going to see a, a difference in their lifestyle. All right. So uh, when you come into, if you're physically here and you come into a church, we watch, you know, we watch you. We, we see how you are. We ask you your testimony, share with us your testimony. Sometimes you can pretty much tell where a person is just by hearing their testimony, you know. Um, but, uh, um, you know, then we watch and we see where you're going and what you're doing. Um, I had uh, a church that I pastored a long time ago, years ago. Um, it was a little country church. And uh, we, had, uh, we had a fellow in there that was uh, homosexual. Now, um, he didn't make it known. He didn't even ever confess that he was trying to abstain from it. But he was a seriously talented individual. He could play that piano. And uh, he wanted to play the piano. And he just wanted to play the piano. That's all he wanted to do was sing to the Lord. And he had a beautiful voice. <laughs> And uh, um, everybody thought he was wonderful. And uh, you, you, are you going to let him play the piano, Pastor Brad? And I was like, well, I said, uh, um, it's kind of obvious that he was living um, a perverse lifestyle. Um, he was a man, but he looked like a woman. You know, that's warning number one for me. Uh, when I asked him, confronted him, he said that he was actively living a homosexual lifestyle. Um, I don't use the term gay. Gay means happy, and I'm sorry. You know, it's just a euphemism. It's a nice way of saying something harsh. And that just helps them to justify that behavior. Um, I know a dear brother that uh, struggles with uh, the lifestyle uh, that he once lived before he came to Christ. And it's part of his flesh. It's ingrained. Sin is ingrained in your flesh the day you're born. But when you live a lifestyle for so many years and then you surrender to Jesus, God changes you within. When you're born again, you're changed within. And your spirit is what's going to be saved in the day of judgment, not your flesh. The flesh has to die, full of sin. Uh, the brother hates the desire. He hates it. He doesn't want to do it anymore. But he recognizes that it's there, and he confesses it openly. And uh, I honestly believe with all my heart that he's saved, that he's born again, that he loves Jesus. And I believe he's going to spend eternity with the Lord. Um, uh, wrestling with the desire is um, something that we all do. So, you know, you can't say, well, but it's homosexuality, and that's an abomination to God. Okay, well, so is lying. Do you lie? Have you lied? Will you lie again? I mean, you know, you look at the six things that the Lord's hate, Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him, you know, and, and you look at them and, you know, and, uh, you know, lying's one of them. So, but nobody makes a big deal about that. Why? Why? Um, because it's not so obvious. You cover that up pretty good. Um, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, um, I honestly believe with all my heart that it doesn't matter um, what you did, what you are doing, what you will do. It, what matters is what you believe and who you believe in that makes the difference. Um, true saving faith will change the person and there will be, uh, it's, it's a lifestyle and I honestly believe this. It's the lifestyle that's bent towards serving God or that which is bent towards serving sin. Um, which way are you bent? Um, are you bent towards the Lord or are you bent towards serving self and sin? Um, 
I believe that when the conviction of the Holy Spirit is upon you and you recognize your sin, you confess it and you ask God for help and it just seems to be just a constant banging your head up against the wall. You just keep running into that same old thing over and over and over again. Um, do what I did. Um, surrender it to Jesus and uh, focus on helping others and doing things in the name of the Lord for others. When you focus on others' problems, on others' issues, on others' needs, self becomes a thing of the past. And uh, you'll end up uh, being the example that God has called you and created you to be. Um, we grow um, daily. Uh, and it's a daily growth process. And it's uh, something that the Lord does and uh, not us. So give him thanks and give him praise for that promise of eternal life. And uh, we'll give the Lord all the glory for everything. All right? We can't take any credit for anything that we've done. I always say it. You know, I take credit for nothing but my sin. So uh, thank the Lord for his promise. And uh, um, we'll give him praise. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you for the promise of eternal life. I thank you, Lord God, that uh, we're going to be with you for all eternity. And I know, Lord God, that uh, one day the sin that's in this flesh will die. It'll be gone. It'll turn to dust. And Lord, we'll be able to uh, spend eternity with you in spirit, Lord God. And uh, we give you thanks and praise for that promise. Um, I know that uh, none of us want to sin, Lord God, but we have that struggle with that flesh. Help us to overcome it today. Help us to be a better example, Lord God, um, for those that are around us. And uh, we trust you for all our tomorrows, Lord God. We thank you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory and honor for everything. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Have your way with us as we go our way and be glorified, Father, by all that we say and do. And uh, we'll give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great Lord's Day, everyone. And uh, Lord willing, We'll do this again next week in Jesus' name.